Globemaster II en route to RAF Mildenhall is forced to ditch in the Atlantic Ocean, hundreds of miles from land, although at least some of the crew and passengers apparently evacuate after the ditching and rescue ships arrive within less than a day, none of the personnel will ever be found, leaving a legacy of mystery and, for the relatives of the survivors, uncertainty. March 21st through 24th, 1951. Originating from Roswell Air Force Base, New Mexico, the C-124, tail number 49244, is practically brand new with less than 400 hours of total flight time. The aircraft departs Roswell early on March 21st, its passengers consisting of nuclear technicians, air crew, and crew chiefs from Roswell's 509th bomb wing, and arrives at Barksdale Air Force Base, Alabama that same afternoon. At Barksdale, the aircraft is joined by a gaggle of last-minute passengers, including Brigadier General Paul Cullen and his staff, who are en route to the UK to stand up the headquarters for the 7th Air Division, tasked with leading an assault against the Soviet Union in the event of war. Tail 244 departs Barksdale later on the night of March 21st and continues on to Limestone, later known as Loring, Air Force Base, Maine. The aircraft and its crew depart Limestone on the morning of March 23rd on their fateful flight to RAF Mildenhall in England, flying at an altitude of 9,000 feet. Their route will take them near weather ships stationed at various points, with whom the crew conducts routine check-ins by radio. At 0100 Zulu on Friday, March 23rd, the crew checks in with a British weather ship call sign for Yankee Juliet, located at 52 degrees north, 20 degrees west. The crew gives their position as approximately 800 miles southwest of Ireland. This is where some of the details become hazy. Some accounts state that shortly after their 0100Z check-in, the crew made a mayday call to the U.S. Coast Guard weather ship Casco, reporting a fire in the cargo hold. Other accounts suggest that the initial alert occurred only after the C-124 failed to make its 0200 Zulu check-in, leading the Air Force to dispatch a search aircraft more than six hours later at 0920 Zulu. In any event, a B-50 Superfortress, some accounts refer to it as a B-29 Superfortress, commanded by a Captain Muller, is dispatched from RAF Lakenheath to find the C-124. At this point, the story becomes even more hazy. Some accounts indicate that the ditching location was known and state that Captain Muller's Superfortress arrived overhead and found the survivors in their life rafts, possibly with the C-124 itself. In this version of events, the C-124 crew gives their location as 50 degrees, 22 minutes north, 22 degrees, 20 minutes west. Other accounts paint a less clear picture of this stage of events, indicating that while Captain Muller's crew did see flares, they did not positively identify survivors, and the life raft they found was either unoccupied or possibly flipped over. When the Casco arrives at the crash site on March 24th, they find no trace of the survivors and only a few pieces of debris from the aircraft. An extensive search effort ensues, including numerous U.S. and U.K. warships and aircraft, as well as the USS Coral Sea and its air wing, which arrive on 25 March. However, no bodies are ever found. First, some analysis of the basic facts of the case. According to one researcher, there is no mention in the official investigation documents of the crew making a mayday call and reporting a fire in the aircraft. However, the accident report did state that analysis of the debris indicated that a fire or explosion had taken place. Regardless of whether this radio call occurred, what happened after the ditching? Had the crew safely evacuated the aircraft when Captain Muller's Superfortress arrived overhead? Again, it is commonly reported in the online literature that all the passengers and crew had successfully escaped the aircraft following the ditching. However, it is not clear how this was known. If the C-124 crew did escape the aircraft and enter their life rafts, they should have been able to establish contact with Captain Muller's aircraft using their Gibson Girl radios. If Captain Muller actually did establish radio contact with the survivors, this should be clearly stated in the accident documentation, but this is not the case. Moreover, if Captain Muller established radio contact, one would expect the exchange to have included at least a few pertinent details about the nature of their accident. Thus, it seems more likely that radio contact was not established with the C-124's crew after ditching. Instead, 
The crew's survival was inferred based on flares fired into the sky, which were reportedly reported by the crews of multiple ships and aircraft involved with the search effort on March 24. In the commonly told version of events, the entire crew of the C-124, safely ensconced in their life rafts, somehow disappears between the hours when Captain Muller's superfortress returned to base and when the Coast Guard ship Casco arrived in the area. However, in the more likely course of events, as inferred previously, Captain Muller did not directly observe survivors, and the condition and location of any survivors was never known with certainty. What is better attested is that the search effort did recover a minimal amount of debris, reportedly only 81 items, including mostly small pieces of wood and packing material. Apparently, the only items unique to the aircraft or its passengers was a bag with some paperwork belonging to a certain captain who had been aboard. So what happened to tail 244 and its occupants? According to the accident report, the aircraft was well equipped with survival equipment, including nine six-man, sometimes described as five-man, life rafts, 56 life vests, three emergency radios, and 13 cold-weather suits. One researcher has asserted that the rafts might not have been properly maintained and points out that the cold weather clothing on board was adequate for the crew but not for the passengers. Nonetheless, on the whole, there seems to have been sufficient equipment to enable at least some of the crew to survive on the surface for several hours. So if the aircraft did land intact, there should have been survivors. But did the aircraft land intact? On balance, the evidence seems to support the idea that the C-124 landed in a relatively controlled manner. If the aircraft had broken up prior to or during ditching, one would expect there to have been much more debris, including bodies. The accident report noted that the aircraft was carrying cargo likely to float, such as some inflated spare tires. Moreover, the reported sighting of flares suggests that at least some of the men escaped from the aircraft long enough to signal for help. As noted, the accident report stated that analysis of the debris indicated that a fire or explosion had taken place, though it could not be determined whether this event had took place in the air or after the aircraft was already on the water. This analysis was apparently conducted by Douglas, the manufacturer of the C-124. One could call into question the motives of Douglas, as an explosion due to an accident or sabotage would provide a more convenient explanation for the accident than a completely unexplained disappearance, which could be due to some flaw in the aircraft. This is all mere speculation, though. If anything, it is possible that Douglas and the Air Force quickly grasped onto the explosive explanation in lieu of other hard evidence, as bureaucratic organizations are wont to do, something which seems much more likely than either organization taking the initiative and risk to engage in willful deception. The analysis by Douglas reportedly discovered parts in the debris that were consistent with what is commonly referred to as an M50 incendiary bomb, or formerly an AN-M50. This was a bundle bomb that was used by the United States and in a similar device but under a different designation by the United Kingdom during World War II. These were dropped in large quantities as part of carpet bombing campaigns against enemy cities. Assuming such a device was on board TAIL-244, why was it there? Could it have been placed intentionally? In the literature on this mishap, much is made of the presence of Brigadier Cullen, who had previously played a leading role in the Operation Crossroads nuclear test at Bikini Atoll, and had commanded the Second Air Operations Group, and was thus knowledgeable about the reconnaissance capabilities of the Air Force. This has led to speculation that the aircraft was downed as a result of an intentional effort, presumably by the intelligence agencies of the USSR, to either kill Brigadier Cullen or capture him for interrogation. While intriguing, this last possibility seems unlikely. Unless the plotters had reason to believe that the aircraft would follow a very exact schedule, it seems that a time bomb would provide a great deal of uncertainty in terms of exactly where the aircraft would be forced down. With many U.S. and U.K. ships and aircraft available to provide support, for example, Captain Muller's Super Fortress, it does not seem that the Soviets could reasonably assume that they would have unsupervised access to the ditched aircraft. A saboteur on board TAIL-244 could have mitigated the uncertainty of a time bomb, but such a person would have to be insane or almost suicidal to take action condemning his own aircraft to a ditching in the Atlantic Ocean, a course fraught with peril and with, at best, even odds for survival. As far as the sabotage being intended to destroy the aircraft and kill its passengers rather than facilitate their capture, this theory too has its problems. 
If a bomb failed to destroy the aircraft and could be traced back to the Soviet intelligence agencies, the blowback would be immense, and it is difficult to see how the value of killing a mere brigadier general and his staff could justify such a foolhardy gambit. Thus, if there was some kind of explosive on board tail 244, it seems more likely to have been brought on board inadvertently and or transported in a haphazard manner, causing it to accidentally ignite during the flight. But is an explosive even necessary to explain the accident? The Air Force's fleet of 448 C-124s experienced numerous deadly crashes during the aircraft's roughly 24 years of service. Most of these accidents seem to have been the results of crew navigation mistakes or other typical dangers that were more common during the era, such as poor weather forecasting, maintenance errors, and routine technical malfunctions. However, it's worth noting that another C-124, tail 520968, also disappeared during a long overwater flight, in this case in the Pacific, en route from Wake Island to Hickam in 1964. So it's entirely possible that the aircraft could have been brought down by a much more prosaic error or malfunction, and that the chemical analysis of the debris suggesting fire and or explosives could be mistaken or simply the result rather than the cause of the mishap. Regardless of the exact cause of the mishap, if the aircraft landed intact, what happened to the crew? How much of a mystery this is depends on the facts of the case. As noted previously, some accounts of this mishap hold that all 53 men escaped the aircraft and entered life rafts while under surveillance by Captain Muller's Super Fortress, only to be missing when other ships and aircraft arrived in the area the next day. In this telling of the story, emphasis is placed on the presence of Soviet ships in the area, with the implication that the Soviets may have rescued the survivors of Tail 244, only to spirit them away to a Siberian gulag. In support of this theory, there is some evidence that the Soviets did indeed intern some Americans during the 1950s who were captured during reconnaissance missions over or near Soviet territory. In addition, Brigadier Cullen had apparently been assigned as a liaison officer in the Soviet Union during World War II, so it is possible that he could have been recognized by Soviet military or intelligence agents aboard a ship and marked for detainment. This last theory would require an incredible level of coincidence, though. With regards to the baseline theory about a passing Soviet ship opportunistically seizing the crew, this too has its problems. While it is certainly plausible that a Soviet ship would have rescued the survivors, to do so in willful secrecy would require considerable initiative and chutzpah on the part of some Soviet naval or intelligence officer. Such a gambit would seem to run a considerable risk of being a major international incident. In contrast, unless someone recognized Brigadier Cullen, it is difficult to see how the Soviets could have quickly determined the intelligence value of their guest. So, so much for the version of the story in which the entire crew survived the ditching. If, on the other hand, Captain Muller's crew caught only glimpses of flares and observed unmanned life rafts, then there is much less to explain. Perhaps Tail 244 did indeed ditch largely intact, but then quickly sank or was consumed by fire, both of which would explain the minimal debris recovered afterwards. In this scenario, it is still possible that a few men could have escaped the aircraft and survived long enough to launch flares, but then succumbed to the ocean or simply been missed in the search. Some variation of this last scenario, while more mundane, does seem the best explanation of the evidence available. Having said that, this mishap still leaves more questions than it answers, and the available data is scarce. If you are aware of something that this analysis has missed or have access to source documents, please contact me in the comments. And of course, let's remember the human element to this tragedy. Not only were many wives, parents, and children robbed of their loved ones, but they were left with considerable uncertainty. How had their husbands, fathers, or sons perished? Had they died quickly or slowly succumbed to hypothermia? Had they been spirited away to a Soviet gulag to live out the rest of their days? Perhaps the wreck of Tail 244 will someday be discovered on the ocean floor, providing more evidence and closure. Until then, let's keep alive the memory of those aboard her.